Hello, and welcome to the Computing Conversations column. This column is from the May 2012 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled Van Jacobson Getting the NSF Net Off the Ground. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I am the editor of the column and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan. For those of us watching the earliest implementation of the National Science Foundation Network in the mid to late 1980s, it felt like witnessing a baby sea turtle hatch far from the water then sprint toward the safety of the ocean, all the while dodging hungry seagulls. Telephone companies wanted to maintain their monopoly on long distance transport using lease line technology in the US and X25 data networks in Europe and elsewhere. Well-developed proprietary networks were already available from commercial vendors, including IBM's SNA and DECnet from digital equipment. The stakes were high. Through patents, licenses, and usage fees, telephone companies could extract profit from every aspect of distributed computing. And if NSFNet succeeded, it would prevent those companies pr from providing a full-stack solution to wide area data networking. Companies that owned the core network technology also owned the edges of the network, and could ultimately set the agenda for all hardware and software connected to it. If NSFNet had selected DECnet as its underlying protocol instead of TCP IP, in all likelihood, instead of carrying an Apple or Android phone right now, you would have a DEC phone in your pocket running the VMS operating system. If this seems fanciful or unlikely, look up the AT&T You Will advertisements from 1993 on YouTube. The future would have been very different if proprietary forces had found a way to own the Internet's core in the late 1980s. The Seagulls were completely aware of this situation, and they knew it was at stake. It's why such a large flock gathered over this lone baby turtle sprinting for the safety of the ocean way back then. When the NSF decided that its first national network would adopt the TCPIP protocol, we all breathed a sigh of relief. At least with TCPIP, university computer scientists and other open-minded technologists would collectively own the network technology. We could make the network a neutral ground and move innovation forward under own, our own control without the sluggishness of proprietary companies that worried most about reducing their market share. Our baby sea turtle had successfully dodged the seagulls and made it into the ocean. But soon, after NSFNet first deployed, the previously solid TCPIP protocol started to experience extended outages. I talked to Van Jacobson of Park, a Xerox company, about the causes of those early problems and what it took to get NSFNet running smoothly again. One reason for our excitement about TCPIP was that it allowed us to write a limitless number of applications for the network. Researchers could develop low latency applications such as instant messaging or remote login, medium bandwidth applications such as email, or latency tolerant high bandwidth applications such as bulk file transfer and mix them all up on the same network infrastructure. Proprietary networks like SNA and DECnet supported limited use cases via carefully crafted implementations that made sure each application got the network access that it needed. By deeply understanding each particular type of traffic, these proprietary networks could maintain balance between the needs of competing applications. Although this functioned well, it meant that each new use case on these proprietary networks required careful engineering to fit in with the rest to avoid destabilizing the overall network. This approach kept network performance consistent, but at the cost of extremely slow innovation. TCP IP networks were truly layered in that the lower levels didn't discriminate based on traffic generation applications. The hope was to support a wide range of applications without requiring special case tuning for each new application. As NSFNet rolled out, it pr proved to be an immediate success with the growth of traffic and the number of connected hosts increasing at 15% per month. In fact, NSFNet's size doubled every five months. This led to some problems, as described by Van Jacobson. Now you're tying together 10 megabit campus infrastructure with 56 kilobit wires, and it was wildly popular because people that couldn't talk could suddenly talk, and their sending emails and moving huge files and uh, just everybody's really excited about this technology but um, you know, any one of those campuses could oversubscribe the net by you know, a factor of a thousand so uh, we had a lot of packets piling up and getting dropped. 
Jacobson confronted the failure of using TCP IP over slow lease lines to extend campus networks nearly every day. At the time, I was a, a researcher at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which is in the hills up above the Berkeley campus, and I was also teaching on the Berkeley campus. Even back in those days, which was mid-80s, uh, we had a, for every class, there was a messages group, you know, like a little news group that was set up. All the assignments would be put online. Uh, and I was trying to get course materials from my office in LBL down to a machine in uh, Evans Hall at Berkeley. And uh, it, there was like zero throughput in the net. It was uh, one packet every 10 minutes or so. The same problem was happening all across NSFNet and anywhere else where TCP IP was used for a wide area networking. It seemed like almost as soon as a new connection was added, it worked for a few days until more users joined and then everything ground to a halt as the link became completely clogged with traffic. And no one knew why. This failure to scale rekindled the debate as to whether TCP IP was a suitable protocol for such a complex and difficult task. Many suggested scrapping TCP IP and switching to DECnet. The physics community had already built HEPnet, a wide area network based on DECnet protocols. It seemed to work quite well and could smoothly balance low latency access, such as remote login, with high bandwidth access like file transfer. Perhaps TCP IP just wasn't up to the task. Perhaps academics couldn't build robust networking protocols. And using networking software from a commercial vendor was a better option. Van Jacobson and the teams that built the TCP IP implementation in Berkeley Unix weren't about to give up. This was simply a small flaw in TCP IP that needed fixing. They knew that TCP IP was well engineered and had performed exceedingly well in other networks with diverse types of application traffic, but with fewer users. Their first hypothesis was that there must be a bug in the software. Went down and talked to Mike Carrolls, who was heading the BSD group, the people that develop Berkeley Unix, and he's getting reports of these problems from all over the country. We talked for uh, a long time that day and on succeeding days about, well, what's going wrong? But is there some mistake in the protocol implementation? Is there some mistake in the protocol? Is, uh, this thing was working on smaller scale tests and then it suddenly fell apart. I think we struggled for three or four months just going through the code, uh, writing tools to capture packet traces and looking at the packet traces and trying to, to sort out what was breaking. They spent months searching for an elusive bug in the design or implementation that they would ultimately never find. In a moment of desperation, they decided that perhaps their initial assumption was simply wrong. And I, I remember uh, the two of us were sitting in Mike's office uh, after we've been pounding our head against the wall for, for literally months. And one of us, I can't remember which one, said, you know, the, the reason I can't figure out why it's breaking is I don't understand how it ever worked. Uh, you know, we're, we're sending these bits out at 10 megabits. Uh, they're zipping across campus. They're running into this 56 kilobit wire. Uh, we expect them to go through that wire, pop out on the other side, go through... Uh, how could that function? That turned out to be the the crucial starting point. That uh, at that point we started saying, "Well, what is there about this protocol that that makes it work? How does it deal with all of those bandwidth changes? How does it deal with the multiple hops?" They switched their focus from searching for a bug to measuring TCP/IP's behavior when it functioned properly across a wide area network with a combination of fast and slow network links. TCP IP wants to pre-send more than one packet to fill the pipeline with packets and maximize its use of available bandwidth. The sending system starts by sending several packets, and then it waits to send more until it receives acknowledgments from the remote system. If the initial number of packets is too small, it isn't possible to efficiently use high-speed connections. And if the initial number of packets is too large, the packets pile up at the slowest connection and the system drops them. At some point, the sending system detects a timeout and resends the packets, which only makes the problem worse. 
according to Jacobson. If you turn them on, suddenly you get in this repetitive failure mode uh, where you saturate the, the buffering that was available at some gateway, and then when you retransmit, you do the same thing again, so you're always losing packets. But if you turned it on more gradually, then you wouldn't overload the buffering and you'd get enough of a clock going so that you'd control the amount of uh, backlog to fit the available buffer, but you'd still be growing the number of packets in flight so that you'd eventually get a, you'd start with a kind of sporadic clock, but you'd eventually fill in the details and get a per packet clock. Jacobson called it the slow start algorithm. If we could get every TCP IP implementation to implement the slow start algorithm, we could get our baby turtle back off the beach and back into the ocean for good. An absolutely critical element of the slow start algorithm is that every computer in the network needed to implement it in a similar manner. If some operating systems implemented slow start and others didn't, those computers that sent packets more aggressively would get better throughput than the responsible slow start using computers. There was concern that if some but not all of the TCPI implementations used slow start and new market entrants didn't, it would lead to repeated network collapse and endless arguments as to who was at fault. Time was of the essence as new TCP IP implementations were under active development in many companies and universities. Thankfully, according to Jacobson... So remember it was a much simpler time when you're talking about all the TCP IP implementations on the planet. At that time there were like four. So there was the Berkeley Unix one, there was the MIT PCTCP, there was a BBN one that was used in butterflies and imps. Uh, and there was a Multics one. Once the slow start design was in place, the team quickly started to develop fixes for the Berkeley Unix operating system to demonstrate the algorithm. Up to that point, they had made lots of changes deep inside the Unix kernel to instrument the network protocols and develop models of what was going wrong. Before they knew what the problem was, these kernel modifications weren't particularly well thought out or elegant. I had this horrible driver hack that would let us snarf packets from the kernel, and I mean, it was really a horrible driver hack. It was the way you said what you wanted to snarf was by ADB in the kernel. You you wrote in binary some new values. These are the ports that I want to look at, and the driver would capture those into a circular buffer, and you'd read kernel memory to pull that buffer out. Craig Laris and Chris Torek, who were working in my group at uh, LBL and uh, were both longtime kernel hackers, were just embarrassed at this and they put together a really nice clean driver uh, thing called BPF, the Berkeley packet filter that uh, would let you pull packets out of the kernel by a, uh, a very efficient I.O. control interface. Once the first version of the slow start algorithm seemed to be working on the Berkeley computers, it was time to share the code with other schools running the Berkeley Unix to validate the idea and determine if the patches actually solved the problem. Jason and Carol sent the patches to the TCP IP mailing list, and an eager group of software developers and system administrators started furiously testing because the problem on their networks was so acute. The initial results weren't very promising. Installing the patches crashed the system. But working with the other developers, Jacobson and his team quickly improved the code in several subsequent releases over the next 24 hours. After about a day, we got a version that didn't immediately panic and then started working on the... Uh, the actual algorithms and a little bit of tuning to make sure that it actually did good all the time and didn't do any harm. Just completely a, a community effort and you know, sort of when the, the community was saying this uh, mostly does good and never seems to do harm, that's pretty what, much what Mike needed to put it into the kernel, so he took that, the community developed modules and rolled them into the BSD release. It took about a month between the first release of the slow start patches and when the code was of sufficient quality to be included in the official Berkeley Unix release. It eventually debuted publicly as core capability of the BSD Unix 4.3 Tahoe release in June 1988. The other major TCP IP implementations quickly followed suit and, a, and in a remarkably short time, the slow start algorithm was virtually universal. Although TCP IP engineering and improvement is nearly continuous, 
The slow start algorithm solved the last major engineering issue that caused the entire internet to crash. With billions of computers connecting and millions more coming in every month, including several in your pockets or purses, it's comforting to know that they all come from the factory with the slow start algorithm built in. The algorithm's very simple concept allows a TCP IP implementation to gauge the bandwidth for each connection by starting out a little tentatively. And once it gets a sense of the available throughput for the connection, it quickly expands its window of in-flight packets to make best use of that throughput. Interestingly, as the routers that make up the Internet's fabric become faster and have more memory, they're storing more in-flight packets, longer, and then forwarding them later, when the TCP IP protocol would suggest that the packets be dropped. When this happens, the packets that are successfully transmitted after a delay have a slower apparent round-trip time. When your system sees this slower round trip tum, the slow start algorithm starts backing off because it thinks that there's a bottleneck somewhere between the sender and receiver, which leads to an unnecessary reduction in throughput. A router's proper behavior is to discard packets that have been stuck in a router too long to properly communicate the nature of their network to the sending and receiving systems. Van Jacobson continues to research the best way to use resources in packet switch networks. His latest thinking is content-centric networking which puts the vast amounts of memory and processing power found in backbone routers to good use instead of causing problems like buffer bloat. Increasingly, we're streaming content from places like YouTube, Netflix, and live TV over the Internet. IP multicast has long been a hoped-for solution in this space, but it has proven difficult to completely synchronize all sources and destinations connected to a common stream and adjust to varying network conditions, connection speeds, and con congestion. In addition, multicast operates at the IP packet level and not at the TCP or stream level. Thus, it can't take advantage of knowing how packets fit together to form continuous content. Although it's a gross oversimplification, content-centric networking uses buffer space already present in routers to provide the ability to efficiently access streams of content from a single source going to multiple destinations. Content-centric networking naturally handles widely varying network connection throughputs as well as relaxes the need to send every single packet to all locations synchronously. We plan to visit Jacobson again in a future article to explore content-centric networking in more detail. This column is from the May 2012 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled Van Jacobson Getting the NSF Net Off the Ground. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I am the editor of the column and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan.